Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and start the webinar. Um, my name is Eric Elliott. I'm a hunter education coordinator with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I have been blessed to be a wildlife officer for about 26 years and I've got the best job going. So tonight we're gonna be talking one of my favorite subjects and that's buck hunting. Um, it's something that I'm super passionate about. I love, I love hunting. I've been hunting since I was a little boy. And, but we're gonna keep in mind that tonight's presentation is, is more of a overview of hunting. So we're take, gonna take a flyover view. And that being said, I mean, we could break every one of these little slides into actually probably a webinar. So we're gonna kind of take a big picture view and also keep in mind that the you know, presenter tonight, um, Caleb, we're not experts in the field, but we're just regular guys that have been hunting a long, long time. And then we've, we've also been around a lot of hunters in our careers. With that, I'm gonna in introduce you to Caleb I. Caleb's been a game warden for about five years. He's a lifetime hunter. And I'm thankful that he's with us tonight. He's got a reputation, a good reputation as a game warden. He's a fair, uh, fair game warden. He treats people with respect, even people that have been written tickets by Caleb in the field have commented to me how courteous, how respectful and how fair he's been. So I'm thankful that he's with us tonight. Caleb's also an avid and successful deer hunter. Um, he's probably not gonna wanna brag about this, but I'll brag for him. Last year, he killed two bucks with his bow, and those were public land bucks on, you know, on over-the-counter areas. So he's been successful with that. Um, and I've noticed even talking with Caleb, there's two things that make him successful, probably, not only successful as a game warden, but also as a deer hunter. He's patient and he's really tenacious, really tenacious. He doesn't give up. So that being said, let's get into this. So why are we here? Well, what's our motivation to hunt? So I've noticed, you know, every time I get an email from um, a different department, a, a department that I've applied for, it's just like Christmas time. You're just waiting to see the draw results. And that reminds me to tell you that June 2nd is the deadline for big game draw in California. So talk to me, Caleb, why, why are we here? Why, why do you do this crazy thing called buck hunting? Yeah, first, thanks uh, for the introduction. I'm happy to be here. Um, so yeah, here on the slide, um, I've shared some photos of kind of what motivates me to hunt. Um, for me, it's all about the adventure and um, spending, sharing those memories with the fa family and friends. Uh, my wife is uh, pictured in the photos with one of her bucks. Uh, my dad's in the middle. Uh, my late father-in-law is on the right. And then um, you can see we've done some different types of hunting. Um, Backpack hunting, you know, going in on horseback in a drop camp. I mean, that's that's right up my alley. I just I can't get enough of that. And then um, also for the meat, um, we love eating deer, and you can see deer steaks, and um, we make roast and stews, and that's that's a big motivation too. Is just the delicious meat. Absolutely, I love it. I love the pictures and. You know, I do the same thing, just motivation for me to get out in the woods and hunt. Uh, same kind of thing, just adventures, creating lifetime memories with, with family and friends and um, putting smiles on little kids' faces. Um, and then, of course, you hit on one. You kind of stole my thunder a little bit about meat. And, of course, we're doing the webinar close to dinner time, but... My goodness, is there anything that beats a good, a well-cooked uh, venison steak? That's just, it, really nothing can beat it. So 
Um, let's go on to the next slide. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to be talking deer hunting tactics. So we're going to be talking about where and when to hunt, preparing for your hunt, and kind of some basics on how to hunt. So tell me a little bit about this buck, Caleb. Yeah, so this buck's pretty special here. Um, not only is he my biggest California public land buck, but he's also my uh, first uh, backcountry buck. Um, so we rode in on horseback into a drop camp and uh, basically got to hunt this buck with my favorite tactic of spot and stock and actually ended up stalking in on this buck is under 20 yards, maybe like 18 yards and um, got to harvest him with my bow. And yeah, it was a huge adrenaline rush because it's always kind of a dream of mine to uh, harvest a buck like that in the back country. And um, yeah, being able to pack him out on my back, back to camp and had my dad and a couple other uh, family friends there. It was, it was quite the adventure. That's awesome. So let's just get get down to this. Uh, so where do you where do we hunt? So I guess in asking that question, you kind of have to pick a style of hunting. Um, so how did you grow up hunting, Caleb? Talk to us about that and maybe how your hunting styles have adapted and changed over the years. Yeah, so I started hunting um, when I was well, I got my hunting license when I was I think nine or ten. You know, started bird hunting, and then when I turned 12, I got my first uh, deer tag, and uh, I, it was always one of those, you know, watching my dad go deer hunting, and I always remember him leaving and going on a hunt, and I just couldn't wait for him to get back, see if he got anything, so I'd already kind of had that drive in me. I couldn't wait to get a deer tag and go hunting with him and experience everything it had, um, so growing up, um, just kind of started out my first, you know, deer tag, general zone, D zone, uh, deer tag. And um, honestly, a lot of the tactics, which I think is probably the most popular tactic was road hunting. Um, a lot of times we just get in the truck and drive all around and probably mostly did that for the first few years of my introduction to hunting. And then uh, it just kind of, kind of finally clicked. I'm like, Hey, you know, I'm, Plus to be healthy and have these two legs. And I started thinking, um, like, why not get out and walk a little more and kind of explore, explore the country and um, see, see area that maybe a lot of people don't ever see because they don't, you know, get out and walk and check out new country. So after years of road hunting, you know, it is a good tactic because you, I mean, that's the best way to learn an area, especially a new area. You kind of learn. Um, where all the different roads meet. And because I had that knowledge, that's kind of what made me comfortable with, hey, if I go up this finger over here, I know I'm actually gonna drop off on this other road that's on the backside. So that's kind of how I looked at it when I first started exploring hunting by foot is like, there's no way I can get lost because there's a road all the way around this mountain that I wanna hike. And then from there, I just kind of, I kept exploring more and more, um, venturing out further. Um, and then eventually it turned into, hey, I want to, you know, do a backpacking trip into the backcountry. And um, I think that's about, you know, as extreme as it gets. So, um, yeah, that's kind of yeah. how I've, I've evolved as a hunter. So what's your favorite style of hunting? My favorite is um, definitely more open terrain where I can uh, glass up deer and then, uh, you know, put bucks to bed. and. Um, spot and stock. I I love that so much. Yeah. So we're going to be focusing quite a bit on your favorite. I mean, we're going to talk a lot about spot and stock hunting, and um, we'll go over. We'll even go over some of your favorite hunts and some of the stocks that you've been on. And but we'll save that a little bit for later. Let's move on to. Yeah, real quick, a little more on my background. Um, See, so yeah, I've been hunting since I was 12. Um, started out rifle hunting. So this will be, I think, my 19th deer season coming up. And then I didn't start deer hunting or archery hunting until about 
2010. So I think this will be my 13th season. Um, so I was, I still rifle hunt, but I primarily, I, I love archery. I would definitely choose it over, over rifle, but I still pull the rifle out every now and then. Excellent. So how do you choose a spot to hunt? What goes into your decision-making on tag selection? And we're looking at a premium restricted and non-restricted deer tags. Um, tell us a little bit about those and how you kind of make a decision on what to apply for. Yeah, so a little background on kind of the deer zones and tags. Um, if you don't know, our department puts out a big game hunting di digest every year. Um, in that digest, you can find all the information on tags and how many preference points it might take to draw. Um, they're broken down into these three classifications, uh, premium, restricted, and non-restricted deer tags. Um, and basically how a, a zone or tag gets that classification is really all dependent on a, on a date of when it's sold out. Um, so like premium tags, um, they usually, you know, usually your X zone tags, they all go, they're all um, distributed during the draw after the draw results come out. So there aren't usually any leftover tags. So I believe it's the, the business day after July 1st of the previous year. If all the tags sell out by then, then they're classified as premium. And in a similar way, um, rest restricted tags are the business day after August 1st of the, the previous year. So, um, and then all the rest are considered your non-restricted or, you know, typically they're your general tags that are over the counter. Um, yeah, so without giving, giving out your uh, secrets on where you hunt, uh, tell me kind of your strategy of what are you hoping for uh, as far as, you know, applying for tags? Yeah, so using this digest as a guide, um, obviously I know how many points I have and I can look at zones that maybe I can draw or maybe I need a few more years to draw. Um, a lot of times, you know, like starting out the general zone that I hunted, it's just kind of always a default. That's that's kind of the zone I go back to when I know I'm not gonna draw a premium tag. And then um, if I know I'm not gonna draw a premium, then usually I, I go with two um, general tags or, and then um, usually as far as a premium tag, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for whatever, whatever premium zone I want, um, but I always put in no matter what, because, you know, if you don't know a percentage of the premium tags, 10% of them go to a random draw. So you could always get lucky and draw with zero points. Um, so it's always worth trying for the zone you want. And then whatever tag you hope to get on your second choice, put that as your set, your second. That makes sense. So Tell us about like non-restricted deer tags. Are you are you usually hunting deer every year? Do you choose to to hunt deer? Let's just say you don't uh, draw a premium tag. Are you looking to hunt deer every year somewhere? Yeah, I'm always looking to to hunt deer every year. So um, like last year, I, I ended up with two um, like more general over the counter tags, um, non-restricted tags. Um, so yeah, I'm always looking to go, like I said, back to my default zone that I grew up in, kind of my home turf. And then another zone is just one that we kind of explored and have found some success. So, and I've actually found um, continued success there. So I really look forward to, to going back to that every year. Right on. So let's talk a little bit about methods of take. So there's advantages, disadvantages to all of these. Let's talk a little bit about why you bow hunt. What's an advantage to learning archery and bringing out the archery tackle and hunting archery? Yeah, so typically, um, like especially the general zones, I guess all the zones, a lot of zones have an early archery season. And so the, 
it's an opportunity to kind of get out. Like if you're not an archery hunter, it's, it's an opportunity to, to pick up a bow and kind of extend your season. Um, even if you're not too serious about it, you can always use it as more of a scout trip. Um, cause another advantage is like the picture listed. This is, you know, probably a picture around July. You can see that it's, they're all bucks. So typically the bucks, um, in the summertime going into archery season, they run in bachelor groups and they're usually more visible and active. Um, but they've just got a totally different mindset than when they become hard earned during rifle. Um, so I've found more success ever since I've become an archery hunter. Um, it's just my general rule with like general, you know, non-restrictive, um, hunts. It's, I always say I'm lucky to see one legal buck. And a lot of times I, I never see a legal buck, but archery, it seems to, uh, increase that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and then another you know, so there are some art late season archery hunts, which are kind of going to the rut. So that's, that's a bonus. The only thing is, um, you know, they take years to draw. So you kind of need to save up points for that. Right. Um, muzzleloader. I've never hunted muzzleloader, but um, kind of the same thing. A lot of the muzzleloader hunts in California are, are geared towards late season. So you're kind of getting the pre rut or rut. So usually, you know, the, the bigger boys are coming out to play and um definitely make the fun the hunt a lot funner right uh, um and then rifle um like i said i still pick up a rifle every season after archery's over but again um i mean the pro is if you see one at 200 yards you can shoot it but <laughs> um yeah it's just trying to find one that makes it tougher yeah so are you generally seeing more deer during archery season than you would during rifle season? I am. That's, that's what I've noticed from my experience. Um, Same here. I'm trying to think real quick, just, you know, my 19, well, this will be my 19th season. So after 18 seasons, I think I've, I've been fortunate to harvest 10 bucks in California. And I think only three of them were rifle. Three rifle versus seven archery. That's so, awesome almost two times, well, more than two times more successful with a bow. Yeah. So let's talk about preparation, preparing for a hunt. So uh, with this slide, so when do you start preparing uh, and practicing? Let's just talk archery. When, when do you start bringing out the bow? Are you one of these guys that hunts year or practices year round or are you more uh, gearing up after you figure out what tag you draw? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, every year I, I try to start earlier and earlier. Um, I will be starting about this time because, um, you know, I more than likely this year I'll wind up with my non-restricted tags again. So I, I, I still, even though it's a non-restricted tag, I'm still just as excited as if it was an X-Zone tag. Um, I just love getting out out there and chasing the deer. So about about now is when I'll start uh, making sure you know the bow is um, sighted in still. Um, just start doing the reps so that um, you find your anchor point again. And um, just repetition is so important that way when it you know comes down to it in the field when that buck's standing there. You know, hopefully all that practice pays off and you can be successful. Yeah. How about uh, knowing your effective maximum range while shooting? How important is that? And have you ever seen any incidences in the field where somebody is taking shots that maybe they shouldn't be taken? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely heard stories. I don't know that I've seen it, but, um, you know, you hear people all the time that maybe they they just picked up a bow for the first time and they, they haven't practiced with it. and they go out and decide, hey, I'm going to give archery a shot, but they haven't put the practice in, really don't, maybe don't know how to shoot the bow correctly. Right. And they see a buck and they're just, you know, don't know the yardage, don't know the range, and they're just kind of eyeballing it and slinging arrows. And yeah, but more than likely, you're just going to wound a deer. Um, and that's not what, what you, you hope for. 
Right, exactly. So let's talk a little bit about scouting, Caleb. Um, so how do you find a good deer area? What goes in, what's going on in your, in your whole scouting preparation? Yeah, so again, kind of going back to my default zone, I mean, it was just kind of like chosen for me because that's just, you know, where my dad took me. So honestly, I feel like the more experience you get in an area, the more you learn to scout even better. Um, so oftentimes, you know, just because I've, I've been hunting that area for so long, I, I kind of go back to the same areas, just knowing where to find the deer. Um, and I mean, a lot of times, like if you are new to scouting, you know, if you, you find an area that you're interested in, go, you want to be looking at the trails, see if there's fresh track, um, fresh droppings, um, trail cameras are a good option just to, you know, see if, uh, if there, if there is deer activity in the area. Um, I can't say that I've ever really been successful in patterning deer like with, with trail cameras, but it's always something fun to do. Yeah. Um, set trail cameras up and, you know, hop in the truck with your family or friend, just run up. It's always fun to, you know, see what you got on the, the SD cards. Yeah. How about uh, e-scouting? Do you do much of that? I, I do a little bit, um, especially like this time of year. I just kind of get excited to go back into areas and kind of wonder, you know, what's what's maybe a little further in. And, um, yeah. I do have my, this year I'll have my first, uh, elk tag in Idaho. So I have been, um, looking e-scouting and kind of marking waterways and, um, just trying to learn as much as I can through other podcasts because I've, I've never elk hunted before. So it's all new to me. And so I'm just trying to learn the area best I can. Yeah. Yeah. How about, uh boots on the ground scouting where you get out and get after it on foot. Talk to me about that. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, depending on the, the terrain, sometimes it might be better to get up on hike up to a high vantage point and look over a, a wide country. And, um, sometimes you just get a better, uh, better, uh, visual on an area. You'll be able to pick up more. Um, yeah, if you're going in the back country, yeah, sometimes it's worth, you know, hiking in there before just so that maybe you want to know how long it's going to take you to go in there. Um, I know my wife and I did that one time on a tag. It was a new area and we thought, hey, let's give, you know, backpack hunting a try. And so we hiked in and, um, you know, found out that, hey, it took us like four hours to get in. But keep in mind that um that wasn't with all the hunting gear and yeah. the camp gear so i feel like yeah doing that is just good to kind of know what what to expect going in and then also gives you an opportunity to you know see what animals you see absolutely um how about what time of year do you start looking for for bucks and patterning bucks is that something you do like a couple months before the season or a few weeks what's your strategy there yeah so usually i mean like the zones that i hunt um a lot of the deer are going to be migrating kind of right now back into their summer areas in the higher elevation um but with it being like a record winter a lot of the areas that i would normally go to probably not going to be able to get into there until i don't know mid to late july but if it wasn't a, you know, crazy winter, a lot of times it could be June or July. Sometimes we just do day trips. Um, but yeah, usually, usually before season, um, a month or two before, um, if you, as long as you can get in there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's talk a little bit about gear. I mean, we could get into the weeds big time on this, but I mean, I'll, there's a lot of gear in this slide. Maybe tell me about some gear that you use that maybe some people don't think about very often yeah i think um so again you know being an archer i've learned how important a, a rangefinder is so i'd highly recommend if, if you don't use a rangefinder already definitely try to get you one 
Um, I was, you know, when I uh, first started, again, you're just kind of new to something and don't really think about everything. Um, so I was guilty of this when I first started archery hunting. I, I didn't have my own rangefinder. And um, I think if I did, I, I probably would have been successful my first year archery hunting because um, I happen to be hunting this area where there's a bunch of spotty meadows and little timber lines. And um, I was getting ready to hike, hike my way out. And I, I caught movement on the edge of the meadow. And I thought it was a coyote or something at first. And then I looked again, and actually this little, uh, this little fork buck jumped in the meadow. Didn't see me stand there. I was actually walking my way back out. And uh, he just put his head down, started feeding right towards me. And again, I'd have a range finder. So I was like guessing how far he was. Um, I think I guessed him to be 30 yards. And I drew back and settled my pin. You know, I had a perfect broadside shot. And I shot right over the top of the back. Yeah. And then uh, I went back in there with a, a range finder and it was 25 yards. So yeah, yeah, uh, where the range finder comes in handy. Absolutely. How about uh, what's that? What's the other gear that you think would be absolutely essential, Caleb? Yeah. Um, besides my range finder, I mean, I always have my, my binos. Uh, I mean, even when I'm not hunting, I always have a pair of binos in the truck and Obviously, for work, we always have our binos, but I think good glass is very important because you got to be able to find the deer. You know, that's that's step one in harvesting a buck is you got to be able to see them, and you can you can see so much more if you have good optics, combination of binos and spotting scope. Yeah. So if you're gonna cut weight, you wouldn't want to cut weight in the uh, the optics department. So do you usually carry a, a spotter with you? Um, I do if like we're going on horseback because like weight's not usually an op, you know an option. We don't have to lighten the load. Um, so I, I usually take everything in. Um, I'll always take a spotter. Um, I did do a, a backpack hunt last year and I did pack a spotter in even though I, I didn't really need it after the fact, just kind of the area that I was hunting. I, I could see everything well enough with my binos that it was kind of extra weight that I didn't really need to pack. Yeah. Outstanding. And I mean, there's a lot of other gear, especially it sounds like you and I both do a lot of uh, horseback hunting and this gear here, this uh, in reach, it's, I think those are lifesavers for sure. That's something to, that we've been using a lot and carrying those just in case. And then the other thing that that I absolutely is essential, especially the older I get, is uh, is a good pair of boots. I mean, nothing can ruin a hunt faster than having a pair of boots that's giving you blisters. But having a good pair of boots that's worn in and uh, tried and true, that's, that's I've just been on so many hunts where guys are back at camp uh, nursing blisters and you feel sorry for them and then you put on your old boots and you're out rocking again. <laughs> so, so let's get into some of the nitty gritty here. So what are, what are some of the, some deer hunting tactics? Um, and so I guess one of the things right up front we got to tackle is we got to know what our quarry is, know what you're up against. So when you think about deer, what are what are the de their defense mechanisms? What are you thinking about, Caleb? What what do you what keeps them alive out in the woods? Yeah, I mean, number one is not don't underestimate them. I mean, they're they're really smart animals, um, and they have really good senses. You know, sight, hearing, smelling. Um, they've obviously been hunted for years and years um, from, you know, other predators to to us human hunters. I mean, they, I'm sure they adjust and learn things, you know, over the years. Um, so that's always, I'm always keeping that in mind. Like um, there was a, there was a hunt with my wife where we had spotted this buck and he's kind of on this sage um, bench and nice three by three. And 
she was a hunter. She had a, it was a rifle tag. So we go hiking up there and um, there was kind of a rock wall on the back end where, so basically this buck couldn't really get out that easily. He couldn't go over the top. So we, we hiked up this draw and came around the corner and um, basically we snuck right into his back, like the back door through his bedroom. And we got in there and we're slowly moving in there, knowing that, he, you know, he's right here. He's not too far. And using my, my binos, I, I had a feeling that he bedded down. So I kept glassing and kept taking a few steps glassing. Eventually we got so far in there where I was like, we already passed this buck. And I know he's still in here because I didn't see him go out. And again, like, right, th you know, don't underestimate them. They're smart. Um, Cause as soon as um, I realized that, Hey, like, I think he's still in here. We, we had kind of backtracked on the trail and we're going to like, see if he was bedded in here somewhere, try to get him up. And I took maybe, I don't know, five steps back down the trail. And I had a different angle, you know, when I turned around to walk back the way we just came and right at like, 90 to, or a 45 degree there, I looked down on the ground. This buck was laying in the fetal position with his head on the ground, like hiding it. And that's why I couldn't see his antler tips when I was glassing the brush. Like he knew we were there. He knew he was had. And I mean, his will to survive, he knew he had to lay all the way down on the ground with his head on the ground. Wow. And as soon as, yeah, he saw me, I mean, his eyes got big and he bounced and took off and yeah, he, he survived. He, his uh, survival instinct saved him that day. Yeah. So you mentioned don't underestimate them. So how does that play out like on a given hunt? Uh, are you talking about like not cutting corners? And so tell me about that. Yeah. So if we're just kind of like making up a scenario where, you know, say you see a buck, um, if he's bedded or standing kind of, I don't know, a couple ridges, fingers over, and, you know, you got to get closer to make a, an effective shot. Um, it is a game of, like, first seeing them before they see you, but then also making sure you're staying out of sight and staying, you know, keeping in mind the wind so that they're not going to smell you and blow out of there as well. So, yeah, a lot of times if if it takes, like, I'll go the extra mile to make sure that I'm not seen um, to increase my chances of, of success. Like, maybe there's that small chance you can just just crawl right over the, the, the finger in front of you, and maybe he doesn't see you, but maybe he does. So if, if, if it's ever a question and I have a longer way to go around and I know that I'll be more successful, I'll, I'll always choose the longer way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, how about... Uh... Let's just say you do, you do make a mistake, or maybe that deer is able to detect you uh, before and has you pinned. Is that is it is everything lost? Do you just kind of give up and just kind of let that thing go, or what happens when you do actually the deer do see you or detect you? Are there strategies that you've used in the past that have been effective that actually? letting things settle in yeah a lot of times um i mean if i accidentally got busted by the buck i'm after or maybe another doe that i didn't see was bedded there or a lot of times if you just stay still um sometimes you can get away with things with things that you might not think you can but at, at that point you have nothing to lose so you might as well try yeah. um so yeah sometimes just staying still or um um just sometimes even um i guess if you're like still hunting or walking sometimes if you're just quieter um because you know these deer and they're, they're in their environment they know the sounds in the woods or wherever they live um so i mean if you're just stomping through making a lot of noise of course they're going to blow out because like hey that's not a bear it's not a deer it's not a squirrel it's probably some other you know it's a hunter or somebody walking through like they, they know those noises. So yeah, sometimes you can get away with uh, not moving or sometimes slowly moving and making noise. Um, I've, I've been successful still hunting um, really quietly. I mean, slow, slowly taking steps and 
even if you're going to make noise, like especially in like more timber covered areas, um, you're going to snap little pine needles or sticks, but you can get away with a lot more than you think. As long as you're going super slow and making the least amount of noise that you can. Yeah, absolutely. So it's super slow, define super slow. Let's just say you're in a pretty decent buck area and um, it, it is timbered and you're doing a still hunt and you're walking through the woods. Uh, sometimes it's hard to define that, but are we talking like a mile an hour or a quarter mile an hour? What are you thinking? Yeah, I'm, as, as slow as you are quiet. I mean, I'm <laughs> I'm right. not really tiptoeing. A lot of times I think I, I do like my, my heel to toe. I mean, sometimes I guess depending, I, I do tiptoe, but um, and sometimes it's like stretching out to maybe land on a on a small rock instead of a, a clump of pine needles. So like yeah. I'm I'm scanning the ground, picking like even if everything's noisy on the ground, there are some areas you can step that are a little quieter than others. Yeah. How about our sense of hearing? Do you use that? Have you ever used that and actually heard deer walking around? Yeah, so um, there's been times, you know, still hunting, doing that same strategy, just, you know, going real slow, trying to be as quiet as I can. Um, and a lot of times when, when you're still hunting like that, it's good to, you know, only do a couple steps at a time and then stop for a little while, glass around or just listen. Because, yeah, I, I've, I've heard deer before, like, if, if you've heard deer, like, kind of crunching through whatever environment you're hunting, you kind of can pick up, like, hey, that's that's a deer, that's definitely yeah. a deer and yeah I've, I've been successful getting close to um, one example um I, th I believe there's like six deer in this little like meadow area and i was kind of staying on the trail so that that's another strategy is you know if you can stay in the deer trail because usually those are a little more worn down than just the regular ground cover um, so that's what i was doing in this this scenario i was kind of just slowly going through this deer trail and then eventually I, I stopped and listened and I heard what I thought was a deer and I looked up started glassing and sure enough there was I think like five does and one little teeny tiny fork by spike um I actually had a couple two of the does they eventually came down the trail I was on and I had them at I don't know less than 15 yards and then the the fork by spike came even closer at like 10 yards I, I didn't wind up shooting that buck it was during rifle season but yeah, it was, it was pretty tiny. I, I let him walk, but I mean that was that was a really cool experience, and awesome. only those type of experiences you can get, you know, out in the woods. Absolutely. So, we'll talk early morning tactics, Caleb. Um, so, what's going on? What are you, what is your goal when you get up in the morning? And let's just say you're on a spot and stock hunt. Yeah. So. Usually we're getting up, you know, well before sunrise. Um, typically we have a spot that, you know, we glass from. So we're getting to that spot um, well before sunrise, setting up, you know, the, the spotting scope or, you know, finding a resting area to lean against a rock, like in the picture, um, to get a, you know, a sturdy rest. Um, so yeah, the goal in the morning is, you know, glass whatever, country that you're you're hunting and hoping to to find as many bucks that you, you can go after um because there's been times where we'll be watching multiple bucks in a few different areas on the ridge and i mean every buck you spot i mean that's that's a stock opportunity so keeping tabs on all of them especially if you're you know hunting with a few different people um there's been times that we've been able to go on one stock it wasn't successful but like hey no big deal there's another buck over here bedded down let's go try that stock so um that's kind of the the, the goal in the morning is hoping to turn up a buck so that you can get a stock on yeah so are you looking to actually put the these deer to bed is that is that kind of like the your goal number one a, a lot of times, yes. Um, it just depends. Um, 
it depends on where they're at, I guess. I mean, if if it's if they're you spot a buck that's kind of closer and he's down in a draw and you think, you know, scanning the terrain, um, you think you can come over the top and he's just, you know, you can read their body language. Is is he gonna feed there for a while? And yeah. you can close the distance in time to to sneak in to range, then I, I would try on that 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 um scenario, but a lot of times, if yeah, if it's one that's wide open, like I know I need to wait for him to bed, then yeah, we'll we'll wait. It really just depends on what's right in front of us, and then we kind of read the situation and go from there. Yeah. So, afternoon tactics. Tell me about. Let's just go through one scenario. Let's just say uh, you don't have any deer spotted in the morning. You maybe lost track of deer is that one of those things where you pack it up and go take a nap or do you keep after it what do you guys do yeah sometimes taking a nap isn't a bad idea or grabbing a fishing rod and going fishing the creek um, especially if you for some reason feel burnout or your eyes are tired of glassing it's always good to take a break mm -hmm. um, but yeah sometimes I do think it's common for a lot of hunters like you know do your morning hunt then you go into camp and yeah don't go back out till the evening um but i've i've actually found some success during the midday early afternoon you know i think uh, there's some bucks that they'll go to water um during the middle of the day or maybe move move to a different bedding location so it is an option you can glass and try to catch something moving or um, one scenario um, I, I knew I knew that it's common in this area for, for bucks to go to water during like late morning midday so I just decided I think it was during one of the fire years you know a lot of smoke I couldn't glass um, it doesn't take much smoke in the air to not be able to see a you know and spot spot deer effectively on a ridge so I decided, hey, I'm going to go ahead and um, change plans and I'm going to walk down this canyon and see if I just can't bump into a deer coming to water. Wind up hiking all the way in there. I don't think we saw anything on the way out, kind of like hot footing it, kind of thinking about lunch, not really hunting, kind of let your guard down. Yeah. And then I just kind of caught something off to the left. Like I, I felt like something was looking at me. And then sure enough, there was two two small bucks right there in the creek one was standing in the creek one was standing on the other side and um i was able to sneak in on on one of the bucks and harvest him and it was all just by kind of a middle of the day tactic of thinking hey you know the deer might go to water and it happened to work out in that scenario not yeah. that's going to happen all the time but it's just a tactic to keep in mind that there can be success um, if your initial plan doesn't work out you can yeah. Always. So let's just talk about what happens if your plan did work out and you've got bucks bedded. Uh, run us through this slide, and I think I might see you in this picture, brother. Yeah. So um, on this hunt, there was, you can actually kind of see the deer up above the round bush. Um, he was actually bedded in the shade about. If you split the distance between me standing there and him, he was bedded right right in the in the shade of that big round bush. Um, I had him at 11 yards. Um, so basically, we, we spotted this buck. He's he a nice three by two, but he was running with a bigger three by three, and put him to bed. Then eventually, the uh, the, the big three point moved off to another bed, but the the three by two stayed in this this location. So again, it was kind of one of those deals. It's like, hey, we can either take a nap or go fish or do something else. But I'm like, there's an opportunity. Like he's still under that bush and I think I can get up there even though it's super steep and you can see that it's shell rock. You know, I was keeping that in mind. I was like, I know this is probably a, a low probability stock, but um, I think it's important to have a mindset of like wanting to make opportunity that then talking yourself out. Like I could easily say, ah, I'm never going to get close because the shell rock's too loud. Um, so I started my stock and I knew that buck was in there. And again, just 
like kind of like a still hunt tactic. I was slowly uh, climbing up up that that hillside, and it's a lot steeper than it looks in the picture. But again, strategically looking at the rocks ahead, trying to find the bigger ones that looked a little more sturdy. And I mean, eventually, like I said, I, I made my way all the way into 11 yards. And honestly, that, that's way too close for, for archery. But because of how steep that country was, I had to get that close. And so when I was standing right where I'm at in the photo, I, I could just see the tips of his antlers. And I was thinking, oh, perfect. You know, I'm, I'm obviously within my effective range. And I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Like, all I got to do is wait him out. It's just a waiting game now. And um, I just needed him to stand. So when I was standing there, I, I couldn't get a good footing. I was trying to like, you know, once I got there, now I got to shift my feet to get a good shooting stance. And um, during that time, I, when I was shifting my feet, I actually made a little noise and obviously being that close, the buck heard me. And again, the more you get into deer hunting um, and start paying attention to the, the body language of the deer, so this buck, I could see his antler tip. As soon as I made that noise, I saw it lock and just still. And I just know like, that's not a good sign. Like he's gonna bust. Sure enough, like second later, I mean, he just shot out of the bed like a rocket. And um, that was him after he went on the other side of the, the bush there to kind of, you know, figure out what, what was going on. And I never, never was able to harvest that buck, but still it was probably one of the best stocks that, I've ever put on just yeah. given the, the steep country the shell rock um the location of the buck it was it was a lot of fun yeah so what can we learn from this stock even though it was you weren't able to harvest this buck what surprised you what did you learn from this i mean I, every step i got closer especially once i got into range i was like wow I actually pulled this off and I was, I was shocked, especially when I got to 11 yards. I'm like, I did yeah. not think when I left, I mean, this buck was probably 800, a thousand yards away. I didn't think I was going to close the distance to 11 yards. Um, yeah. so that, that was the biggest shock. So it goes to being tenacious and not giving up and, and giving, giving it a try. Um, I love it. Um, Let's spend some time talking about the crunch time, executing the broadside shot. So first, first of all, we talk about broadside shot. Is that what you're looking for, Caleb? Is that would you be uh, would you be okay with a shot that's not a broadside shot? It just depends. I mean, if it's quartering away or quartering towards, I mean, they got to be pretty close for me to feel comfortable taking a shot. But yeah, usually I, I'm waiting for that that broadside shot. Outstanding. Um, so what are you thinking, right? So you've made the stock, you're ready to roll. And do you go through any kind of ritual or what are you thinking right before you take the shot? Yeah, so if I'm, um, I'll, I'll use an example from last year. So um, put this, nice three by three to bed and stalked all the way in and I was less than um, 20 yards from him and he's laying in his bed right below me I had good wind the wind was blowing my scent actually over him and um, so I was kind of leaning on this rock face and you know just basically waiting him out waiting for him to stand up and I, I was basically there for three hours waiting for this buck to stand up. So during that time, like I already have, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get ready for that shot. Cause I know it's going to happen. Like you don't want to wait to, to knock your arrow when, when the buck stands up, like you want to have all that stuff ready to go. So, I mean, on any, any situation where I, I'm in range, I've, I've already got an arrow knocked. Um, like I go through my whole shooting sequence. Um, a lot of times your peep sight on your string, when you pull it back, you know, it'll turn a little bit. So a lot of times I'll, I'll twist that peep before I draw back or knowing that I'm going to be drawing back. So that way when I draw back, the peep straight and not slightly off. Um, so yeah, I'll go through my whole sequence. Um, I'll be taking uh, yardages with my range finder, trying to determine, you know, the possible routes he's going to come out. Um, yeah, in that scenario, I, I knew 
there was a pine tree that was kind of just in line with him. I think it was 19 yards. So I knew that, all right, you know, I'm going to be 20 yard pin is going to be perfect. So um, basically I'm doing all that type of prep and getting ready for the shot. In those situations, it's kind of tough because, I mean, you, you don't know when the buck's going to stand up. It could be the next 10 minutes or in that case, it was like three hours. So mm -hmm. trying to stay comfortable is hard. And I mean, like that time I found myself constantly like shifting, you know, leaning on hips and trying to squat, but you're, you're trying to reduce your movements and hopefully not make noise, you know, hoping not to bust that, that deer out of there. Yeah. But yeah, as soon as that, that deer stands up, you know, I'm hoping that it's, it's a broadside shot. And, um, in this instance, when this buck stood up, he actually, I, I kicked myself. It's always like you Monday morning quarterback yourself. And it's funny. Cause like, while I'm sitting there on that rock, I'm already thinking of all my experience from the past. Like, Hey, I'm not going to force a shot. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to take any shot where I think there might be a deflection. Like I, I want it to be perfect. Like I, I just put on this nice stock and I, I I'm, I'm not going to mess this up. And, um, so when this buck stood up, there was actually like, it was a pretty good angle. There was like two trees, but I had like a 12 inch gap, which is a pretty good shooting window at 19 yards. But I'd already played in my head, like I'm not taking any shot where I think it's going to hit anything. So I do think that was my best opportunity because when that buck stood up, he was, he stood there perfect. And I, I had his, his, his um, kill zone, like right there within that window. But I'd already, like I said, talked myself into, hey, I'm going to wait till he clears everything. And at that point, he never stopped once he started moving again. And I, I, I didn't, I wasn't successful in that buck. But yeah, just kind of a, a look into what I'm thinking, I guess, when I'm getting ready to execute the shot. Yeah. You don't seem like a guy that would get buck fever. You seem pretty calm, cool, collected. Um, do you still get buck fever right before you shoot? I can. I mean, it, it definitely, the more you do it, the easier it gets, but it's never a hundred percent. Honestly, uh, I, I get myself so excited about deer season that sometimes it could, uh, like this last season, I, I was so excited. I can't wait to go back to kind of my, my home turf zone to go deer hunt. And I was just so excited hunting all over the place. And I came across this small buck and, I actually got buck fever on him and I, I missed that buck. But yeah. then and I was thinking, oh, there goes my opportunity. I'm, I'm not going to harvest a buck. Might as well go home. Yeah. Well, um, I kept hunting and then actually I wind up harvesting a, a different buck later that day. But yeah, the, the second buck was totally different from the first buck. First buck, I, I, I admit I had a little buck fever. The second yeah. one, I, I got it all out and I was pretty uh, calm and collected and focused on what I needed to do. Right on. Well, wait till you have kids, Caleb. Then you're gonna, the buck fever is going to really start. Um, yeah. I don't think I, I don't think I've ever had more buck fever than watching my sons through the spotting scope. Literally, my hands are shaking, and you're yeah. just hoping things go right. So, I think that's part of the the joy of hunting, just the excitement, the anticipation. Um, so I think if you're getting buck fever, your heart's still in it. Yeah. So tell me about uh, the old saying, aim small, miss small. Do you, do you pick a spot on the deer? Do you, do you actually do that or just kind of shoot center mass? What are you doing? Yeah, usually, um, yeah, sometimes, especially like archery bucks, sometimes their summer coats will be patchy. And sometimes you might find a spot kind of right in that area where you like to shoot and aim for. So if, if there's a spot there, I'll, I'll try to focus on that patch. But yeah, oftentimes like with the bow or rifle, I'm, I'm kind of looking center of the body, you know, a few inches behind the shoulder, try to get away from that shoulder and not hit it. Um, I know a lot of times if, if you hit that shoulder, I think your chances of um, recovering that, that deer go down. Um, so I try to stay away from that shoulder. So do you think in your experience that there's a tendency to kind of rush a shot? Do you think a lot of people miss shots by rushing them? I think so. I, I, I think 
you know, people, it's hard, especially if you never killed a buck before, or like don't have yeah. that much experience. I mean, it's exciting. It's like, here it is my opportunity. There's a legal right. buck right here. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm it's, I, I missed, uh, I can think of all the bucks that I've missed, especially when I was early on in archery. It's, it is, I mean, it's like, you're just so excited to see the buck and want to get a shot. And sometimes your mind is telling you like, Oh, just shoot, just shoot. Like, you know, it's right there, but you, you do got to remember to kind of slow down and focus on the shot and place that pin or your, your sight scope where it needs to be and kind of go through, you know, if you got a breathing sequence or whatever, but yeah, I think a lot of times it's just people get excited. Um, We're going to do a whole nother webinar about what happens after the shot. I know there was a, a question that came in and it's a really good question about what do you do to carry your meat out of the back country? And so I think there's, there's a lot there. And not only about blood trailing, but retrieving your deer, um, how to get how much deer away uh, and what's feasible and to get out with one person, one person, maybe two people. So we're going to deal with a whole webinar on that. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, we want to take a little bit of time and answer some questions that have come in. And thanks for to people that have submitted questions in advance. I love it. Um, I think we've hit on this a little bit, Caleb, but um, one of the questions was, do you recommend sitting on a body of water for deer? Let's just say like doing a ground blind um, and waiting at a spring or something like that. Do you recommend doing that? If so, when? Yeah, I think. Um... I mean, if, if you have knowledge that there's deer coming into that water, maybe you have trochem photos and times and a pattern of a buck coming in, and or maybe there's just a lot of sign in that area. I, I think it's definitely a, a tactic you, you can use. Um, to be honest, it's not a tactic that I've used. Um, I have set up kind of similar situations where I I know there's like a bachelor group going into an area, so I try to get in there before them. And almost ambush them, um, but yeah, I haven't really um, hunted from a blind. But again, it's it's worth a shot if 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 you see the sign and know there's there's deer in the area, it's it's worth yeah. a try. I think so too. I've had it where we've had deer patterned where they're going into water in the evening, and um, so we you know we're on the back country, so we're not bringing a blind in with us, but we'll just kind of manufacture a little blind uh, out of vegetation and that's actually works pretty well in the evening time and especially when you've been busting tail all day and you're tired and you're like I don't want to do another 2,000 foot up this mountain and just sitting by a spring sometimes can can bring some good results um so finding this this question is a person is finding bucks before the season, but can't find them once the season starts. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah, it, it seems uh, usually that Friday before, it's like there's a buck around every corner. And then, yeah, as soon as opening day hits, it's like, where'd they all go? Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, Why, I mean, is I that, why do you think that is? Is that just because they sense people in the woods and they, they have, they want to survive? Yeah, it's just a guess, but I mean, yeah, I mean, how how many, I wouldn't be surprised if they've gotten conditioned to knowing, hey, about this time of year, this is when all the guys roll in and there's camps everywhere and tomorrow must be the day that um, they're going to start hunting us. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if if that plays a factor. And like I said, the, the deer have been conditioned to that over the years. Um, but yeah, just kind of going back to the question, I mean, I just say keep hitting that area hard if if there's you know there's bucks in that area i mean they got to be there somewhere i know it seems like sometimes they crawl under the rocks but they got to be there i think doesn't that play into why you archery hunt too is to kind of get away from some of that pressure and so you're seeing deer when they're velveted up and they're not in that thick stuff yeah yeah so um yeah, like we mentioned, the, the bucks, like during summer into archery season, a lot of times they're bachelored up, got velvet, 
um, you know, this is when their, their antlers are growing during that time and they're actually really sensitive. So a lot of times they don't want to um, be in that thick cover because the more they, they, they hit their antlers on stuff, it, it, you can tell it hurts because I've seen a buck run before and hit his antlers and you can just tell like he was like, oh, that hurt. So they're a little more visible, a little more out in the open, easier to easier to locate. Right. All right. So Caleb was gracious enough to share his email address with us. And he told me prior to the webinar that if you've got questions for him, shoot him an email. And of course, uh, you can shoot me an email. Uh, give me a call. I'll be happy to answer any question that comes in that I know of. And if I don't know the answer, um, there's a lot of stuff on deer biology that I don't know, but I've got good friends and good resources that that may know those answers. Um, so if you got questions on like, what do deer eat or what's their, how is their migration or where their migration is, all good questions, shoot them to me and I'll do my best to find the answer. So that being said, Caleb, I just wanna thank you. You, I couldn't ask for a better presenter tonight. You, you're knowledgeable, you're not arrogant, you've got a humble attitude and, um, I, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thanks for having me, and hopefully this was helpful for everyone. Um, look forward to doing more in the future. Okay, I'll hold you to that. All right. <laughs> All right, thanks, Caleb. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a good night.